and CBS was the channel that was on um, in front of the whatever I was on the elliptical. So I watched, I guess, the first forty minutes mm -hmm. of it, wondering where I was supposed to be slotted in. It was an interesting sleep. What would you have? How how would you have responded if they asked? Uh, you know, there's many articles, this being one of them, it just simply says, taking stock after three days of tragedy. Yeah. Uh, I, that's the theme, and... and you're... Well, I'd say that there were sort of three sets of questions that I found interesting that the interviewer in Face the Nation, someone I actually don't recognize, mm -hmm. um, was asking. Uh, one set of questions was about um, how do we make sure that the kinds of innovations that were taking place in Dallas continue to go forward. That was a, one set of questions. Um, another set of questions was about the rhetoric. Um, the interviewer was mostly focusing on the rhetoric of the activists mm -hmm. and the ways in which that could potentially be counterproductive. And another set of questions was about the relationship between um, policing tactics on the one hand and crime in predominantly um, African-American urban communities on the other. And I think um, I had the most to say about the first set of questions, um, something short and pithy to say about the second. And the third, I think, is kind of a distraction. So, you know, with respect to the first set of questions, I spent um, a whirlwind of 57 days working with 10 other people on the president's task force on 21st century policing and we came up with a set of recommendations, 59 of them. Most of them organized around ideas about how to improve perceptions of legitimacy of policing agencies and, you know, what's necessary to do that. One important aspect of that work is switching around the mindset of the folks who are running policing agencies and who are working in those agencies to think about a broader mission, not just crime reduction, but the importance of community engagement. In my own research, we call that procedural justice and legitimacy, citizen engagement, really thinking about the foundations of democracy, treating people with dignity and respect, um, and encouraging trust. There are lots of things that I can say more about that, but, you know, what I found interesting on Face the Nation is that you know, people will say that that's a goal, and then the uh, recommendations always turn, often turn to things like, need to pass this form of legislation that's in front of Congress right now, or, you know, we need more civilian review boards without really knowing what that is, or, um, you know, we need more de-escalation training for police which is useful, but that's not really what is, that's not what I'm talking about. Um, so that would have been one thing I could have talked about. A second issue that came up a couple of times was, you know, first of all, the name of the Face the Nation program today was Ambush in Dallas, which I thought was interesting. Um, I get why they did it, but, you know, I think it's a mistake to focus on the tragic death of police officers to the exclusion of the deaths of people like Philando Castile and Alton Sterling and the, I don't know, we're well over 500, I think, um, civilian deaths so far. You know, we need to keep both those things in perspective. And so to focus on the rhetoric of Black Lives Matters activists, or they may not even be Black Lives Matters activists, you know, people who are saying, really incendiary things about police without talking about the unbelievably incendiary things that people like, for example, the lieutenant governor of Texas said is a mistake and a problem, um, you know, to not focus on the things that people like Giuliani, um, former Mayor Giuliani said is a problem. Um, so that was second. And then the third was sort of the relationship between this kind of, just the way we've been doing policing over the last couple of decades and whether this is sort of like a price that we have to pay in order to deal with crime in urban communities. Um, you know, 
I just think that's wrong. I mean, I, I'm confident that it's wrong. Um, but again, it's a distraction. I mean, obviously, you know, crime in urban communities can be a problem, but to say that, therefore, the people in those communities have to incur the costs of aggressive policing um, doesn't recognize the value of <laughs> the minimum of people's right to live, let alone um, thinking about constitutional rights and what government is for. So. Well, we bought your book, Urgent Times. That's what Chautauqua has. And I couldn't help but hear you look to Ben and say, hey, uh, not maybe not everything I said there is as current as it was in 1999. Uh, if you had to redo this, what would you do differently? Well, so I haven't read it in a while. Let's we have an extra one if you'd like. <laughs> Let's start with that. But... Um, I think it's important to point out that when that was written, um, crime was much, much higher than it is now. You know, I, have, I find it interesting, actually, to hear folks like Mayor Giuliani talk about this juxtaposition between, you know, literally Mayor Giuliani said on Face the Nation today, on the black side, that's a quote, um, people should be concerned about crime in their communities, and on the white side, we need to understand how people in those communities might view police. Um, yeah. Cartoonish and disappointing, to say the least. Um, but in any case, in the 90s, crime and violent crime in cities was incredibly high. It really was. And um, we didn't, as a nation, um, think about the role that police could play in um, addressing crime. Mm -hmm. And that's been a relatively recent phenomenon to think that you know, very targeted and focused policing could make a difference in crime. That wasn't the way we thought about it. As recently as 1995, you know, as noted policing scholars such as David Bailey would say, you know, people think police can make a difference in crime. That is a myth that I'm quoting. That's not what we think now. You know, policing executives are held accountable for the crime in their cities. And so that book was written at a time where we're trying to get uh, policing agencies to take the idea that they could make a difference in crime seriously, number one. And number two, in interpreting constitutional rights, that courts should take into account the preferences of people who live in those high crime areas um, in assessing you know, what the court often refers to as the balance, the relevant balance between liberty and order in determining Fourth Amendment reasonableness. And the reason why it's important to take account of those people is that they're the ones who have most at stake, right? They're experiencing both high crime rates, but they're also experiencing the incidence of whatever police strategy um, that agencies come up to, to address those problems. So we should think about what they want. Think about them, just as a procedural matter. That was the argument. I must confess, first of all, I'm not, I'm not in, a, uh, in the criminal law world. I'm, in a, I'm just a corporate transactions guy. So I read, I read this, the concept of the book, which was one where you uh, and Dan Cahan? Cahan. Cahan. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Uh, wrote this, uh, and then they sent it out to folks to <laughs> react to it, critically <laughs> to react, us up. <laughs> and then you reply. Yeah. Uh, fascinating approach towards a book. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm more curious about, all right, you did it, you and Dan are high-fiving, all right, good job, <laughs> printer, published, and then this uh, new democracy forum sends it out Yeah. and waits for the response. Yeah. And then as you're reading the responses, some of them are pretty pointed. Yeah. Uh, and how did you react? What was the emotion? Did you want to scream? Um, no. I mean, we were writing um, and we were advocating something that I knew was very controversial. Um, so at the time that this was written, Chicago had an anti-gang loitering ordinance, of the constitutionality of which was being challenged. And Dan and I actually wrote a brief, um, a, 
an amicus brief in the Supreme Court um, that was uh, cited by Justice Thomas, I think, uh, in his dissent. So we lost. Um, and so, you know, I knew it would be an unpopular position <laughs> for people broadly defined as on the left. But I also thought at a, that for the most part, people didn't really understand the nature of our argument. But our argument was not an outcome-driven argument. It wasn't so much that we were in favor of the, of the anti-gang loitering ordinance. What we were in favor was a process of articulating constitutional rights that took into account the goals and preferences of the people who are most impacted. So, you know, I think we thought of our argument as being progressive, um, anti-elitist, um, inclusive, you know, promotion of democratic, promoting of democratic values. That was, that was our goal. Um, and I think it was not to say that the people who were writing are not very smart people, many of them were, but I think that that was a subtle argument that not everyone understood. You know, I think the, the, do, do the, really the last paragraph you talk about rights, because everybody was talking about the rights, but you in your last paragraph talks about the conception of rights. Rights have life cycles, and contradiction between a view of rights and social necessity finally becomes too intense to be endured. That conception expires and is superseded by another one that is fated to enjoy the same career. Is that, do you still feel that way? What I think is that, um, you know, I or did Dan write that paragraph? <laughs> I don't want to throw Dan under the bus. Um, but I do think, you know, that we were trying to convey an idea of rights as being something that's contested uh, over time, um, contested and contextual. And, you know, I'm pausing a little because I think at that time, I was much more convinced than I am now um, of the fact that in a context in which there is deliberation and contestation uh, against a background of goodwill where people are recognizing increasingly um, more and more groups' rights of participation. I mean, so another part of our argument was, look, you know, the notion of, of rights that a lot of the folks who are writing against us are thinking about is a notion of rights that's, you know, ahistorical and doesn't take into account the fact that many African Americans are now actively participating in the political process. And, you know, we have to account for the fact that things have changed. It's not 1968 anymore, and that matters, right? Um, and so I think at that point when I was how old I was, 25, 26, I was more confident of our ability to be more inclusive more quickly than I think I feel today at 2016. You know, there's a, there's a big struggle right now. And one way of thinking about do I still believe that is what I have been able to predict, that this is what we'd be arguing about right now. Um, I think I don't. I would not have predicted that. Because I know that as on that whole rights piece, uh, Professor Dershowitz uh, dropped the Jackson piece. Uh, uh, it said, "But rights are not, as Justice Jackson once reminded us, like a limited railroad ticket. Good for this train at this day only. They are designed for all people and for an enduring period of time." And hence, he was taking some issues with that. Uh, yeah, well, I still think that those people, that, you know, the people who have a kind of um, a very inflexible view of constitutional rights and, the, and of, you know, rights around ideas of, of criminal procedure um, are wrong. Um, I think that's probably true for rights outside that context as well, but that's not my area, so I don't want to say. I mean, you think about First Amendment rights is a pretty easy example. It's clearly true for speech, and it certainly ought to be true for religion in my view. 
but I know less of that jurisprudence. Um, you know, I think I can say that I disagree with his conception while still saying that I was overly optimistic about my own. I went to college expecting to be an engineer, a biomedical engineer. And um, when I was a senior, the summer before my senior year, I worked at Kodak. And that was the year, actually in this area. Rochester. In Rochester. Um, and that was the year that Kodak was litigating their um, instant camera case, the patent case that they lost mm -hmm. to Polaroid. And I thought, oh, patent law, that looks interesting. That could be fun. I could do a law thing and a science thing. Um, so I decided that I would go to law school. Um, it was either law school or medical school. And um, it's something I'm embarrassed to say on camera, but I, um, in order to go to medical school, I would have had to have taken um, biology my senior year. This is after having taken five semesters of calculus, three semesters of physics, two semesters of chemistry, and I was done. So I told the pre-med advisor that I didn't want to take biology, and he said, well, I won't write you your piece of paper so you can apply to medical school. And I said, great, I guess it's law school. You know, so that is kind of how I got to law school, honestly. Where are you from? Where's your hometown? Um, I was born in Champaign, Illinois, and moved to Springfield, Illinois, with my mother when I was 11. So I lived in Illinois my whole life. And um, when I decided to go to law school, and uh, you know, applied to law school, it was when Dick Durbin was a congressman, not a senator. He lived a couple blocks away from my parents, and my parents knew him. And I really wanted to go to Georgetown. That was my lifelong ambition. And so I got into, he wrote me a recommendation, and I got into Georgetown and was super excited about it, was on my way, and um, Georgetown did not give me very much financial aid. And close to the end of the application season, I got a letter from the University of Chicago saying that I could apply for free, you know, they'd waive the application sure. fee. Um, and I said to my mother, I got a letter from the University of Chicago. I've never heard of it. I don't know if it's a good school, but <laughs> I'm going to apply. And they did. And they gave me a lot of money. <laughs> so That's I went. That's a great story. <laughs> well, it's Not a bad school, too, by the way. Right. Well, it's yeah. one of these stories about when you say, you know, did, is anyone in your family a lawyer? You know, it's. This, the whole idea of first-generation professionals in law school is a big deal. And, um, you know, I was one of those people. My mother was a teacher. My father was a social worker. I think I would have thought of my parents as professionals, but no one was a doctor or a lawyer or, or anything, you know. So most important, Cubs or White Sox? White Sox. South side. That was, that was with conviction, too. <laughs> <laughs> Not a pause there whatsoever. Yeah. So did you go to Old Comiskey? Did you? I went a couple times. I mean, like, actually, it's more about being from the South Side than it is about caring about baseball. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Tom, <laughs> when you meet uh, Tom Becker, he's a Cubs fan, so oh. maybe you ought to hold that White Sox yeah. play. Oh. Just, have, just a thought. Just they have cooler gear, too. Yeah. <laughs> Black, white, looks better. Uh, <laughs> did you know you wanted to go into the teaching part of this? Yeah, that's another one of those. Um, fell into it. Or, you know, someone had a higher plan for me. Um, so I get to law school. I was going to be a patent lawyer, right? That was the plan. plan. And um, my second year in law school, um, my criminal procedure professor, Al Alshuler, asked me if I'd ever thought about being an academic. And you know, I'm going to go work for a law firm and make a lot of money like all of my friends. And he said, you know, I think you should think about it. And um, my third year, um, Al Al Schuler, um, the then provost, Jeff Stone, and one other person, I can't actually remember who was in the room then, there were three, but we had a meeting, um, you know, where they tried to encourage me to consider academia, and I was going off to clerk and, you know, do whatever that I was going to do. 
And then um, after clerking, and I worked for the Department of Justice for about nine months total, but maybe four months in, I called David Strauss, who was another professor of mine, and said, you know, I'm ready to think about the, um, the academic thing. And he said, well, let's go to lunch. And I went out to lunch with David Strauss, um, Jeff Stone, who is the provost, their new colleague, Elena Kagan. I went out to lunch, and I thought this was going to be them helping me, you know, decide what to do with my life. Instead, I got grilled, literally, for an hour for lunch, which I didn't think was very fun. But at the end of the lunch, um, Jeff Stone offered me a job wow. at the uh, University of Chicago to be a visiting professor. So what areas did they plug you in? It was really, you know, they said I could do whatever I wanted. Um, so I ended up teaching remedies because I liked that class. <laughs> Um, and I taught a seminar on poverty law, um, and I think that's it, the first year. That's all I did, and then I wrote my job doc. And then I got hired by them. Um, well, I, you know, I had a number of job offers, but I ended up staying at the University of Chicago. Well, Jeff Stone was the first person to be the Robert H. I know. Jackson lecture, I'm sure. John gave you that list. I've seen the list. Yeah, exactly. Uh, what do you know about Robert Jackson? Um, I don't know that much, uh, except I also do know little tidbits because I'm on the Jackson list, so I occasionally. Well, John, <laughs> you, yeah, you, know, you should know. You should know a lot of tidbits. On this day in history, yeah. so you know, of course, I know about his role in Nuremberg, and I know about his um, various roles in government. Uh, you know that, and. It's unusual that one would be uh, an attorney general and do the work he did in Nuremberg and be a justice. Um, I know, just found out recently, and this is going to be, a, I'm going to talk about this for literally five seconds, that he was the chair of a committee, an ABA committee, that led to um, the American Bar Foundation study on criminal justice, mm -hmm. which was pathbreaking, and, you know, apparently, at least from what I can tell in my 15 minutes of research. Um, a lot of it had to do with him, you know, was, was his idea, um, which is pretty cool. Five years from now? Ten if you'd like. No, 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 yeah, because, you know, five, I was trying to think of how old my youngest child is. Okay. It, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine making any big moves until he is at least a junior in high school. So when he's in college. So pack him off to boarding school or something. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I've thought about, um, I've thought about and had the opportunity to do government service, which, you know, hasn't worked well yet because of, um, you know, my obligations to my children. Um, we have in the last two years, Tom Tyler and I have started a, a center at Yale Law School called the Justice Collaboratory, where we are working really hard to change the narrative of criminal justice and policing in particular from one that is organized around harm reduction and a focus on crime and the technologies of crime reduction to a new conversation that is focused on, you know, citizen engagement and the precepts of, you know, a strong democracy and a positive vision of criminal justice. Um, you know, I was noodling around with some different ideas. Justice forward. Um, I've been thinking about that. And um, the way we think about that is, you know, we, our tagline is big theory, big policy. We have a theory, you know, so if community policing needs a theory, like we have a theory. Getting people to think about it, um, doing that work in those terms is, is, is a hard task, um, especially when you're really interested in the basic science of it, which we are. So I'm usually a pretty good translator, um, but I'm more interested in basic science. So to think about shifting from that role, the basic science person, to the um, promotion of those ideas into certain technologies, you can think about doing it in government or in foundations. So maybe in 10 years, 
uh, I'll be working or imagine myself working in a foundation. I think that could be a good platform. Community policing concept, uh, which you still maintain. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a lot of empirical evidence, you know, the engineering part of yeah. you, you know, here, A, B, C, D, here's the conclusion, no questions. Do you have much of that? No, in part because community policing as a concept is ill-defined, so it's hard to evaluate something that you can't or hasn't been well-defined. Um, and what I think we could do, right, is to give it some definition by thinking if the goal of community policing is to promote legitimacy, and if and I'm talking about legitimacy in the social psychological sense, and if the, you know, the the basis of legitimacy is procedural justice and we know that what people care about when um, evaluating the procedural justice of legal actors is um, having input, having a voice, being treated with dignity and respect. None of that's in this book, by the way. Um, the third, um, you know, experiencing fair decision-making, decision-making that's grounded in fact, that's neutral, transparent, and encouraging um, motive-based trust, which actually has a historical component. It's not just transactional. It's about understanding that people carry with them the ways in which they've been treated over time, and importantly, uh, the ways in which folks who are networked with them are treated over time, which requires a reconciliation component. Understanding all of that, and you can build that in to community policing, which I think you can, then you have something to evaluate. Um, and, you know, I think that's possible. But thinking of community policing as evaluating whether police officers are on bicycles and then asking people if they feel good about that is not what I'm interested in. One of the review viewers in the book at the, the back page says, uh, Tracy Mears and Dan Cahan have performed a great public service. They have opened a major debate on a promising idea about how to keep streets safe without throwing out essential legal safeguards. Do you think you accomplished that? Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't. But, you know, again, you have to understand what was going on at that time, yeah. right? So at that time, what people thought about compliance was, you know, a particular conception of deterrence and that people would be motivated to comply with the law because they feared the consequences of doing so, formal consequences. This is a world in which law, a law and economics-based vision of compliance was ascendant, right? And so one of the things we were doing was critiquing that and to say that norms are important, informal social control is important, and government can actually play a role in enhancing informal social control. And I think that's the part that those people are talking about. And um, whether we accomplished it, I don't know, but I do think that certainly um, in 2015, people understand safety of neighborhoods as a co as an act of co-production between policing agencies and 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 people who live there. And that wasn't true really then. That wasn't the way people would talk about it. That wasn't the way Posner would talk about it. I think the next goal is to say that. Um, the kinds of things we want state actors to do in that space are less the things that we talked about in that article. You know, I don't gang loitering ordinances. Eh. Um, I think there's even an article we wrote about you know promoting broken windows, which was never about promoting broken windows as New York City did it anyway. But in any case, I think now. The idea would be policing agencies should take seriously, you know, this this new narrative, mm -hmm. and they should organize their behavior on the street, but literally how their agencies are organized to produce um, greater legitimacy. That's what um, I think is the right way to do things, which we didn't talk about. Are you going to do a book? Oh, I am. I'm working on at least three books right now. One of these days I'll get them done. But see, I can't be writing if I'm here talking. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if Ben were sitting where I am sitting right now and he had this one kind of last question, what would he ask you? Ben, uh, when are we going to write our book, honey? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's probably what he would say. 
Is this to be a collaborative? Uh... Yes. So we are writing a book. Um, we wrote an article a couple of years ago. Has it been two years now? Um, called How the Criminal Justice System Educates Citizens. And the idea in that book was to bring together ideas about um, the social psychology of fairness and legal socialization um, with um, ideas in education about how people think about curricula. And, you know, if I could briefly state it, um, to say that there are formal curricula all over. We're used to thinking about that as school, in schools, you know, what's in the book or what the syllabus is, right? And then there is what education theorists call the hidden curricula, which is how people are actually treated in class and, you know, who sits with who at the lunch, in the lunchroom and who the mascots are. And, you know, you learn lessons from the book, but you also learn lessons from what you experience in classrooms. And so in this piece, we try to talk about the uh, formal curriculum in criminal justice, which we might say is the text of the Constitution around the Fourth Amendment and the Fifth Amendment and you know, statutes that seem to be about being very reluctant to use state power against individuals. And then there's a hidden curriculum, which we, where we see people like Philando Castile being killed by a police officer when he is carrying a gun that he is legally entitled to carry. Um, and that disjuncture teaches people something about who they are as citizens and who they aren't. Um, and so we are planning an expanded treatment um, of that piece. And at book form, we we're going to focus a little bit more on the history of relevant institutions. That's his job. How's he uh, doing? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> He's writing away right behind you. Um, <laughs> and um, I'm also going to focus a little bit more on the social psychology of how people develop um, a sensibility about legalization. Um, so that's the legal socialization piece. We're also uh, Tom Tyler, um, uh, a frequent co-author of mine, is a as a partner in this project, and um, yeah, so that's that's one project I'm working on. Sure. Talk about Chicago, like what it means and how you think of it, and the city or what's going on right well, now. Well, what's going on right now? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I kind of mean crime and citizenry. Yeah, um, it's interesting that you asked that because right before you picked us up. I was having a conversation with a person in Chicago who's deeply involved in trying to help the police. Oh, sorry. Um, the police accountability task force. That's what they call their task force. The PATF. You know, implement the changes, and it's really hard. I mean, you know, mostly I'm heartbroken uh, about Chicago. Um, I think Chicago is textbook in terms of demonstrating how not to do things <laughs> um, in ways that are consistent with procedural justice and legitimacy from um, you know the way the current superintendent was picked and the ways in which politics seem to constantly interfere with good governance um, and the ways in which I have tenure um, the ways in which the mayor of that city seems to demonstrate an inability to understand what policing is for and can be for. Um, so, mostly I'm heartbroken because it's my city. I love it. Since you mentioned the president, where does your acquaintance with him go back to? And tell us about the president. Oh, um, so I actually, my acquaintance with the president goes back to his wife, who was not his wife when I met her. And so I worked for Sidley and Austin one summer, summer after my second year in uh, law school, and she was my attorney in charge. She was Michelle Robinson then. Um, so we you know, hung out, and then she later married Barack Obama, and he and I started teaching at the University of Chicago the same year. 
he was also a visiting kind of person. Um, I was teaching, though. He was writing his book, um, uh, the book, his memoir about his father. And then, you know, we ended up teaching together for 10 years. So I'd see him all the time. We'd have lunch. We'd hang out. He argued with me about that book. Um, but what tack did he take on the book? Well, I do, actually. Um, I think he, it's fair to say, he's, he was a person who always held his cards very close to his chest. So let's just leave it at that. <laughs> Uh, did, did you listen to his argument, or did you? Yes. Okay. Uh, of course I did. Yeah. When did you first think this guy could be president? Um, I worked on his um, ca his campaign when he ran for Congress and lost, and uh, had fundraisers for him at my house. Um, and then he became a state senator, and you know, he was just. A great guy. I mean, I don't think I. I thought that he would be mayor of the city of Chicago, mm -hmm. actually. And um, I had lots of conversations with him about well, why don't you run for mayor? And he said, you know, nobody or for governor. And he said nobody's going to vote for somebody who's lit with the last name of Obama. And I was like, well, we just elected Blagojevich, or maybe Blagojevich was running at that time. I don't. I don't remember. Um, but once he gave the speech at the convention, I knew that he was going to run. So you're on the president points you on a, a various task force forces, but how does it actually work? The task how, how, force? How, how do they actually pull together? I mean, are these you do meet once, twice? They circulate uh, memos. What does that work? It was so much work. Oh my god. Um, so there were eleven of us, and. The president announced the task force on December 1st, but the rest of us, with two co-chairs, Chuck Ramsey and Lori Robinson, the rest of us weren't appointed until December 19th, and that's right before the holidays. So, you know, basically we were told we were appointed, but we weren't going to do anything until, I, don't, I think the first time we met was um, right after I got back from Stanford, right? So like January 7th or 13th or whatever, some crazy long date. Um, and he had promised that the report would be delivered in 90 days. So 90 days from December 1st, not 90 days from the time we started working. So we had 57 days to do our work and have hearings. And, you know, so basically every other week we traveled to some place in the United States and had hearings for eight, nine hours a day um, and two and a half days at a time. So we'd have hearings for nine hours a day, and then we would caucus until 11 or midnight every night, and then we would be writing in, you know, in between time. We had a wonderful staff, really great staff, and there was a private group called SI, SAI, I don't know what that stands for, um, and then some incredibly talented people in the cop's office um, who were already doing regular work. I mean, you know, the cop's office does day-to-day -day stuff, and then they kind of had to drop everything and and be our staff uh, for this. Um, it was a crazy amount of work, and I still haven't lost the ten pounds I gained. <laughs> so, for the benefit for the benefit of those the, in the beta gallery here, what was what was the uh, task force? Um, so, the the task force was. Um, convened by the president to give him recommendations on how to improve the public's trust in police while maintaining public safety. That was our formal charge, um, and to give him recommendations about that and to gather best practices. And we divided our work into six pillars. The first was um, legitimacy and public trust. The second was sort of policy, policy about use of force. And, um, civilian review boards and the like. The third one was about social media and technology. Interestingly, everybody thought that this was going to be a report about body cameras, and so the press was really focused on the third pillar, which ended up not being a thing at all. The fourth was community policing, fifth was training, and the sixth was officer safety and wellness. And um, 
you know, we had recommendations in each of those pillars. And a year later, um, we the final report, so there's a preliminary report in March, the final report in May, um, which was announced in Camden. It's the last time I saw the president. And then um, just this past year, we had an implementation guide looking at all of the places around the country that are making great strides in doing and implementing these recommendations. And um, I'm pretty sure Dallas was one of them, actually. You're terrific, by the way. This is spectacular. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for making the effort to be part of the Chautauqua community. They'll love you tomorrow. Uh, you're going you're gonna to enjoy the... You saw the whole philosophy? You saw where you were speaking? I did see it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. It'll, 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 it'll it's not, neat. You know, I'm going to be packed in front, but way out. So. Yeah, well, I just found that part out today.